We have our full schedule online for MISC. Next week we have Sean Munson, alum, here, um, but he's currently at University of Washington. He's going to be presenting from personal data to personal health, designing for goals and um, collaboration, specifically looking at health tracking and food tracking. So I'm excited for that. Um, just as a preview, we will have the annual MISC retreat. The scheduled date for that is April 30th. And we're combining that MISC retreat with uh, practice talks for Kai. Um, so it'll be a bit of a, an extended session since classes are out. But if you are presenting at Kai or know people who are presenting at Kai from University of Michigan, um, and they would want to do a practice talk, they can come to this document. The link is bit.ly slash miscannounce18. And we're going to start um, sign-ups for that here. I signed up. So this is an example. So put your name and your co-author's <coughs> names. Um, and then the, the paper title, because I know some people have more than one paper at um, Kai. Any questions about that or any other announcements? No? Oh, and the MISC retreat, although not officially confirmed, may have some improv by our very Ooh. own Gabby Mark. It's confirmed. It is confirmed? Okay, it is now confirmed. It just got confirmed. It got confirmed. So look forward to that. Um, as always, we do a review of some papers that people have recently published. So this one is at dub dub dub. It's um, by Tiago Kunha, David Chinhao, and Daniel. Are all successful communities alike characterizing and predicting the success of online communities? Um, they did a large scale study on tens of thousands of groups on Reddit and shed light on what success represents in online communities and what predicts it. So um, take a look there. Italicize this so we know that it has been done. Uh, we've done a lot of these. Okay. Well. Oh, okay. So here's one that is published at Tokai, which is a journal, but um, they are invited to present at Kai. So it will be presented at Kai 2019 by Nas and the Levy, responding to sensitive disclosures on social media, a decision making framework. Um, so through interviews and vignettes, they present a response decision-making framework that explains factors for whether and how people respond to sensitive disclosures from their social media connections. Um, findings include how people's decisions are complicated by balancing their own needs as well as the posters. So um, take a look at that one as well. And. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Um, so today's speaker is Sheila Cotton. She is an MSU Foundation Professor in the Department of Media and Information at Michigan State. She's also the Director of the Sparrow and MSU Center for Innovation and Research and the former Director of Trifecta. She also directs the Social Mobility Research Group, which looks at mobility and autonomous vehicles. Um, Sheila is the author of Designing Technology Training for Older Adults in Continuing Care Retirement Communities and more broadly studies technology use across the life course and the social, educational, and health impacts of that use. So with that, I would like to bring up Sheila Cotton. Thanks so much, Robin. Thanks so much for inviting me to um, come and talk with y'all today and to get a chance to meet some of the faculty and students who are here in the iSchool. Um, we're also an iSchool, um, but we're just a department as opposed to a big, big ass school, is that right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, I am very uh, glad to be here today and uh, look forward to telling you a little bit about some of the projects that I and my students and collaborators have been working on um, over the past few years. So um, I'm a sociologist in a department of media and information, and um, I focus on a range of different technologies in my research and try to understand the impacts of those technologies on people's lives and how we can use technology to make the world a better place, to improve people's health and well-being. 
Um, so much of my work is very interdisciplinary. I collaborate with people all across the spectrum in terms of um, working on projects or trying to solve problems. I certainly don't think that I, as a sociologist, um, will ever have all the answers to any problem out there. And so I think it takes very interdisciplinary teams working together to try to solve problems. So um, as uh, Robin had indicated, um, I look at technology use across the life course, from the very young to the very old and everybody in between, and really try to understand what are the impacts, whether it's the social impacts in terms of connections, social support, isolation, um, or workforce impacts. <coughs> health impacts, uh, educational outcomes. Um, I've done large projects with school systems back in Birmingham, Alabama. I was down at UAB before I moved to MSU. Um, I've done projects, um, project I'll talk about today in um, CCRC's Continuing Care Retirement Communities. Uh, I've done big national surveys, um, smaller projects, etc. cetera, um, from the very young to the very old, and trying to understand how is all this technology use um, impacting our lives. So, um, just a few of the projects that I and some of our collaborators have worked on over the last few years uh, with Bree Holtz, um, who's in our college at MSU. Uh, we have an American mm -hmm. Diabetes Association grant to try to develop an app to help uh, parents and their young kids who have type 1 diabetes to be able to better communicate and to transition that care from parents to children as they're moving into the teenage years. Uh, diabetes is very serious and not being able to manage that is um, a major stressor for parents and for kids. Um, I've done work looking at online motorcycle communities. Anybody ride motorcycles in here? Everybody always says, do you ride? No, I don't, but um, it's really cool though, maybe one day. Um, but looking at how they um, transmit health information and risk and safety information and the impacts that has on their riding behaviors and accidents and those kinds of things. Um, with uh, Bob Rose and Nora Rifon and Salim Alabash, um, we had a project funded by NSF looking at um, online safety, uh, online banking in particular, partnering with the MSU Federal Credit Union to try to understand what are generational differences and how um, uh, different people think about online safety and security and can you actually try to ramp that up? Because uh, as you and I um, both know, um, there's lots of people trying to get your information today, and banking industry has hit up you know, massive amounts of times per day. Uh, so that was an interesting project, looking at, uh, at uh, online safety and security. And then, uh, in fact, that picture is one of our participants from uh, that study. And then um, with uh, one of my, um, or a couple of my graduate students, actually, we've been looking at um, some projects around uh, what we're calling the physical digital divide. Uh, particularly with older adults and um, their younger um, family members. So what happens when their kids and grandkids are in the same space with them and they're sitting there on their devices like some of you are. Uh, I won't call out people. Um, <laughs> and uh, what impact does that have on the older adults um, in the room? And so we've coined this term the physical digital divide. So you're in the same space and ideally you're interacting together but for the older adults in the rooms, there's this divide, this physical divide that's a result of the, their younger family members you know, keeping their faces uh, glued to their devices. Uh, so some work around uh, that and fubbing and, and those kinds of things. So um, a lot of different projects across the spectrum, as, as I was telling uh, uh, somebody this morning, you know, it's really cool studying technology because it's constantly changing and trying to understand the impacts of it it's like, you know, a high-speed rail going down the road and, you know, trying to keep up with the changing technology and the impacts. And we're only in the infancy stage of understanding any of the impacts of all this technology use that we're doing. <coughs> so, um, I thought I'd spend most of my time today uh, talking about one uh, project in particular, and then at the end I'll tell you about a few other um, recent projects to touch on real briefly. Uh, that some of my students and collaborators and other collaborators and I are um, working on. So, um, a few years ago, I met an 87-year-old woman um, who had moved into an assisted living community about a year or so before I met her. And when I met her, um, she didn't have any friends. Well, she had one friend that lived several states away. She was able to see this friend maybe a couple times a year. When that friend came to visit her, um, at her 
retirement community because the woman I met had mobility impairments. She couldn't travel as easily as she used to. She'd never been married. She didn't have a partner. She had, she had no children. And she had this one friend. People in the community said, you know, she doesn't participate in things. She's not very friendly, not very engaged in the community. When I met her, she was very sad. She was, you could obviously tell she was lonely. And she looked like she was on her way to becoming severely depressed. Now, you may think that that's an isolated incident. But the reality is that in today's society, as more people are turning 65 and older every single day than at any point in our history, the rates of loneliness and depression and social isolation are higher than at any point in history. And our society is not equipped to help older adults who are not as well socially connected. Silver tsunami is this term for the mass of people that are turning 65 and older every day. As you can see, it's projected to increase for the next several decades at this high rate. 25 to 30 percent, depending upon the source that you look at, of older adults live alone. Now, that's not such a bad thing. You know, if you're an introvert like me, some days I cherish like, <laughs> when my husband and daughter go off to volleyball practice and I have some time alone. But um, if you have chronic health conditions and you have disabilities, um, then the picture may look a little bit different. So about 43% of older adults have some type of disability. And you can see here some of the different types and their prevalence rates. The 10 uh, chronic health conditions um, have increased quite dramatically in recent decades among older adults. 80% of older adults have at least one chronic health condition. 68% have two or more chronic health conditions. So, you know, hypertension by an, in, a, in and of itself um, is probably not a huge deal, but if you combine that with diabetes or you combine it with heart failure, and some of these other chronic health conditions, and if you live alone, some of these things get exacerbated. So, older adults, a trifecta, perhaps? You know, we know that as people age, your networks change. Sometimes your spouse, your partner, or sometimes even your children, if you have children, pass away. Um, you start to have increased mobility and other health impairments. Sometimes those changes necessitate that you change your living environment. You may not be able to live in the community any longer in your own home. Uh, so some people end up moving to assisted or independent living communities, AICs as we call them for short, because they can't live independently anymore and they need some assistance to be able to maintain their independence. <coughs> so um, can teaching older adults to use computers and the internet help to stave off some of the loneliness, the depression, the lack of independence? Could it be a way to curb some of these declines? In um, a study that we did a few years ago using the health and retirement survey data from that's housed here at University of Michigan, uh, we found in a longitudinal study that uh, being an internet user was associated with a 33% lower likelihood of being classified as depressed for older adults. That's pretty significant. So theoretically, you know, there are a variety of ways that technology usage could potentially impact health and quality of life. Certainly in terms of helping to find information can have a positive impact. Um, but what I speculate is that it's more about those social connections, the contact, the engagement with the social ties that ultimately help older adults to feel like they matter to others, to feel like they would be missed if they were no longer around, um, that have impacts on quality of life. So I think there's huge potential for technology use to help maintain independence, increase social connections, telehealth, all these different things listed up here um, on the slide. But as of most recent Pew stats, only 67% of U.S. older adults go online. 
And I actually suggest that this is an overestimate if you're looking at older adults. Because Pew and their samples are looking at community dwelling older adults who can respond to telephone or web based surveys typically. Uh, so you're ignoring a significant segment of the older adult population who has disabilities that is not able to respond to these surveys. They don't go into nursing homes, they don't go into skilled care facilities. So I suspect that this is a little bit lower than reality. Now we know that for older adults, there are a lot of barriers to older adults being able to use different types of technologies, access. It's certainly less of an issue than it used to be. You know, computers, tablets, mobile phones are a lot more prevalent than they used to be. Um, but my research over the past 15 years or so has shown that relevance is really important. If older adults don't perceive that technology is going to be relevant for their lives, they're going to be less likely to adopt whatever that technology is, whether it's a computer, a tablet, a smartphone, um, a wearable device, etc. So all these things come into play in terms of helping older adults to cross that digital divide to be successful users of technology. So I want to um, briefly tell you a little bit about um, an NIH funded grant that I had, <coughs> a big randomized controlled trial that was designed to teach older adults to use computers and the internet. Not the fanciest technology in the world, right? Um, and a point that I'll make later is, you know, you need to do what's appropriate for the group that you're trying to help solve a problem. So this was a randomized controlled trial. We were in 19 different assisted and independent living communities over the course of the study. The communities were divided up into those that got the ICT training, um, or some of them that didn't get the training, at least initially, uh, but we did other activities with them. What we, I'll tell you about in a minute, it's our attention control group, and then we had a true control that was a survey only group. We collected a ton of data over the course of the study, so five different surveys with them from uh, pre test, post test, three, six, 12 months post um, <coughs> surveys to log data, to focus groups, um, observational data, um, field notes, et cetera. The communities were randomized um, at the facility level because we didn't want spillover. So if we were doing a tech training in one of the communities, we didn't want uh, to also have attention to control group in that same community because some of the spillover might occur from the tech training to the other groups. So we had some communities that just got tech training, some that just got the attention control, and some that were our con true control groups. So our ICT intervention group, um, we had two sessions per week. We'd go in for an hour and a half at the time uh, to, try to do training. We set up portable computer labs each time we went in, because if you, I don't know if you know much about retirement communities, but these communities don't have space generally where you can just set up a big computer lab. They may have a couple of computers here or there, but they don't have one set up for like up to 20 people. Um, so we'd go in and we'd set up our portable lab twice a week um, for an hour and a half each. We'd have an additional third day where they could come in for office hours uh, to practice things that they learned or to um, ask questions about things that we hadn't talked about. And we did this over the course of eight weeks. Uh, originally, we were going to do it for six weeks, and our pilot testing revealed that they need a couple more weeks of practice and help training. We started with the basics. You know, how do you turn on a computer? What are the different parts of a computer? I mean, you're in a high school. You're all very tech savvy, I'm going to assume. But think about your grandmother or your grandfather, or maybe even your great-grandparents for some of the students in the room. Do they use technology? Do they use computers? Uh, so just because we're familiar with it doesn't mean that they're familiar with it. Um, teaching them how to use a mouse was really key. Um, and does anybody know what the thing up at the top is with the yellow in the middle? Mouse mouse? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a big mouse, um, or what some of our participants call rats. It's a joke, y'all are supposed to laugh. <laughs> um, we also used big key keyboards because most of our participants didn't really type. They did the hunt and pecking and it was much easier for them. Um, we developed um, or we used some mouse exercises. So they had to chase little squirrels across the screen to help them get comfortable. We all have a lot of physical control and dexterity in our arms and our hands. A lot of older adults don't. And so using a mouse is really hard for them. Um, 
We taught them to open and close programs. We developed a very specialized training um, manual that the participants said um, was fantastic and better than anything they'd ever used. And communication is really key. Uh, you know, when you're working with different groups, you need to tailor the training to the group that you're focusing on. Um, too often, particularly with older adults, people talk down to them and treat them like they're stupid. In fact, we had people say, oh, my grandson tried to teach me how to use a computer and it made me feel stupid. You know, things like that. So um, don't be condescending when you're working with particular groups. You know, focus on the group at hand and what their skill needs are. Yes, Robin? Um, question about the length of the session, the, the, the intervention. You said it was initially six weeks mm -hmm. and then you pushed it to eight weeks. Yes. Um, because they weren't at a point. We did a pilot um, community first before we actually started the formal randomized controller trial. Mm -hmm. And in that pilot community, um, at the end of six weeks, we had not been able to get through all the materials that we needed to, and they weren't, they hadn't accomplished as much. So, so they, was there a point that you wanted them to reach at the end of yep. the session? What was that? Yeah, I'll show you a little bit and, and some of the things that we covered. So, topics that we covered. Um, we started very basic with, you know, how do you turn on and off uh, the computer? How do you open and close programs? And then we started early on with email, because if you remember that conceptual model that I showed you early on, you know, I'm primarily hypothesizing that the main conduit to impact health and quality of life is through those social connections. Um, and so it, we really emphasized email and helping them communicate with their social ties, primarily through emails. We also introduced social networking sites. I can tell you that the vast majority were not interested in going on social networking sites. Too many privacy concerns, too much information overload. Uh, they much preferred the more one-to-one -one communication than um, the social media uh, layout. Uh, we taught them about how to navigate, searching and finding information, <coughs> social networking, we took them to Hulu and YouTube, which they really enjoyed because they could find TV shows and music from their generations, um, which was really appealing to them. And so, uh, going back to your question, Robin, all of this built up and we scaffolded over the course of the eight weeks. So at the end of the eight weeks, they had an assignment where they had to do a multiple, multiple of these things um, to complete the course. So they had to... Um, find some information online, they also had to find a picture online, they had to integrate it into a document, they had to email it to a family member and get a response back and be able to sum up everything over the course of the weeks. Yep. So our attention control intervention, on the other hand, um, met for the same amount of time over the course of the eight weeks. However, we focused on more social activities. So. Um, Older adults love trivia. We did a lot of trivia contests with them. We did sing-alongs. Um, my student who's at the piano here is actually trained as a um, classical pianist, so they loved it any time that she was there playing with them. Uh, we did different types of board games. We had some special performances by um, usually young adults um, from different musical colleges and those kinds of things. So a variety of different interaction activities, but not focused on learning how to use computers and the internet. And as I said, our true control was a survey-only group. All right, so some high-level um, overview because we've published multiple studies in the book that uh, Robin had noted. And I'm happy to send you papers if you're interested in any of these. So as you might imagine, uh, assisted and independent living communities are mostly female, mostly white, um, and um, it was about evenly split between assisted and independent most of them have decent money. You know, it's not um, somewhere where people that um, have low economic resources typically go. Um, most of them are widowed, as you can see. And like I said, it was a white majority. Yes, Cliff? What was the age range? Um, so they range from 65 up to 102. In fact, one of our participants, when she turned 102, started a blog for her family so that they could see the things that she was doing. Now, unfortunately, when you're doing a study with older adults, particularly a longitudinal study, over time, some people will pass away. And I remember seeing a notice um, come through that she had passed away. This was after the study had ended. And I went to the funeral home you know, site and um, looked at the, 
the blog there and uh, people were saying it was great because I could read her blog. I didn't get to see her, but I could see her blog and see the things that she was doing and we could email and those kinds of things. So it's kind of sad, you know, when you work with older adults and, you know, people pass away, but um, it seems like she really enjoyed the blog and we were glad that we could help facilitate that. All right, so over the course of the study, uh, we saw a range of things increase. The ones in bold are the ones that persisted a year past. Um, so the very final um, follow-up that we did. So we saw significant increases in going online, using email, surfing, looking around, playing games by themselves. Um, one of the things I was kind of sad about that we didn't see a change in was looking for health information. One of our sessions was devoted to finding and evaluating health information online. Because, you know, if you remember, 80% of older adults have some type of chronic disease. 63% um, have, or 68, I forget, um, have two or more chronic diseases. I thought they'd be really interested in being able to find health information. No, they didn't really care about that very much at all. Um, in fact, a couple people went to sleep during that session, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, anyway. All right, so participants um, were more likely to say that using the internet has made it easier to reach people, stay in touch, meet new people, feel less isolated. It's enhanced the quantity and the quality of their communications. Now I can tell you from um, focus groups and observations, um, it was never going to replace some of the contact that they had with their social ties, particularly their family members, um, but it enhanced. It was over and above the face-to-face -face interactions that they would have. So across a range of different papers that we've done, we found that um, those using the internet had lower depression, lower loneliness, feeling more connected to family and friends. They weren't bothered as much when they couldn't see people close to them as they were in the past. And then as I said, the quantity and the quality of um, the communication was increased. You remember that mattering concept that I talked about earlier. So um, in some of our work we found uh, using ICTs was associated with lower depression. That's a good thing, right? But it's mediated through mattering. So using technology um, enhances your feeling of mattering, that you matter to others, which is associated with lower depression. So the original relationship between internet or ICT use and depression goes away, and it's really about those connections and feeling like you're important to other people is what we found. So, uh, yes, Robin? Did it matter who those other people were? We didn't ask specifically about that, unfortunately, but um, I suspect that it was mostly family and friends. I mean, the strong ties as opposed to weak ties. Mm -hmm. All right, so this was a longitudinal study. <clears throat> so one of the things that we we're interested in, what keeps people using um, the internet over time? And we found that independent living uh, participants were more likely to continue using over time. I mean, this makes sense in some ways, right? If you go into an assisted as opposed to an independent living community, you already have more than likely more health issues that necessitate going into assisted as opposed to independent living communities. And what we did indeed find is that increases in instrumental activities of daily living was the main reason that people stopped <coughs> using over time. So if people needed assistance with medications, transportation, meal preparation, etc., that that was the strongest factor that led them to drop out. And this was controlling for general health status too. So in addition to the range of um, quantitative data, as I said, we did focus groups, we did observations, field notes, those kinds of things. And one of the things that people love to do was to use uh, Google Street View to go back to their old neighborhoods. Because, you know, when you move to a retirement community, sometimes it may not be close to where you've lived for the last 20, 30, 50 years. And so people love to go back and see their old neighborhoods. And people said things, you know, thank you, I feel like I visited home today. Now, we did have one woman who got upset because um, uh, she saw where a cherry tree had been cut down in her front yard that had been there for many years. But by and large, most everyone you know, loved being able to do this. 
they said things like, you know, this has opened up a whole new world. They felt like they could actually interact and dialogue with their kids and their grandkids, who were kids who were talking about Google and Facebook and um, all these other technologies. Um, it made them feel like they're more a part of the human race. Now, a decade, the last 10 to 15 years, has seen a shift of people moving into retirement communities. Um, it used to be that people moved in when they were pretty healthy. Now people are trying to age in place for as long as they can, so when they actually do move into these communities, particularly assisted living, they're a lot frailer than they used to be. And so for many of these older adults, this is the last stop. You know, like it used to be that they would move from um, assisted into like nursing home, but usually they end up dying in assisted living, living in particular. So it helped these people to feel more updated and less isolated from our technologically based society. And as some of our participants said, you know, it, it's helped me feel further from the grave. So, you remember that 87 year old woman that I told you about? I don't know why, um, but for whatever reason, she decided to participate in our project. She signed up for the training. And over the course of those eight weeks, you start to see her becoming more engaged and more interested. And she's starting to have conversations with other people. And people are remarking, like, what's going on here? Why, you know, this person is like a totally different person. And at the end, in our post-focus group, she said, I'm a hot 87-year-old. I know how to Google. Now, she's in this picture. I won't tell you which one. Um, but, you know, whether these results persisted for many years, we don't know. But at least for some short period of time, it certainly improved this woman's outlook on life and her engagement with society and her community. So, as Robin said, we did, um, I and four of my former PhD students write a book um, designing technology training for CCRCs, um, if anybody's interested in that or doing work in this area. And, you know, there's a big team, and certainly not me, um, but it's a big team that has done all this work on this project. So, um, I, we've got just a few minutes left. I want to talk uh, just briefly about some of the other projects. Uh, so, um, a couple of students and I recently did some older, older adult uh, focus groups looking at telepresence robots. I know it's kind of hard to see it in that picture, unfortunately, about um, their willingness to use, their thoughts on it, safety, privacy, all those kinds of things. And it was really interesting because um, the participants in the focus groups uh, talked about like their parents would really, could really benefit from using this technology. So most of the participants in these focus groups were in their 70s, and they were thinking about their parents um, finding this useful, but not for them. They didn't need it. Uh, there were privacy concerns that they experienced, but for older people than they were, it might be useful. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, Travis Cadillac, one of my students, and um, is graduating actually this summer, uh, is uh, we've been doing some work looking at fubbing and um, the impacts on quality of life for older adults in particular. And uh, some, uh, we have a large-scale national survey uh, looking at uh, how older adults think about uh, mobile phone use by their loved ones and the impacts on their health and well-being. And then um, along with a couple of colleagues and students, we've done some work in the pediatric uh, emergency department looking at whether VR can help to decrease stress and anxiety among kids and their parents. Now, I have a 13-year-old daughter. Since she was just a toddler, she has been needle-phobic. Every time that she has to get shots, it's very stressful for me. It's even more stressful for her. But So um, we've actually found some interesting results with um, the VR and that um, for uh, kids 10 and older in particular, it may have some really uh, beneficial effects in terms of decreasing stress. And then, uh, as uh, Robin alluded to earlier, I've been doing some work around autonomous vehicles over the past couple of years, uh, both from a workforce aspect uh, in terms of the new jobs and how things are going to change across uh, different uh, 
different types of occupations within the AV world. Um, and then also uh, looking at perceptions of risk and benefits and willingness to use and how what might um, be associated with trying to change some of those. Um, most older adults in particular have very negative views of AVs and are not willing to use. In our national survey, only 19% of those 65 and older said that they would be willing to use a self-driving vehicle in the future. And so there's lots of education work and you know, Lionel and his group are doing a lot of that work um, trying to understand some of the impacts of that now. Um, also done some work with wearables, looking at activity trackers with uh, Wei Peng and Anastasia Kanova, trying to think about for individuals with type 2 diabetes, um, how can you enhance their physical activity, which can help to stave off some of those chronic diseases and lessen the negative impacts of some of the chronic diseases uh, that are most prevalent. And then as um, I was talking with Robin about earlier, although this isn't a picture of the dot, but um, I just uh, got 20 Google Dots in, uh, from a, a, a community partner of mine and thinking about some work with older adults around uh, the Google Dots. So um, anyway, those are some of the newer projects that I'm involved in. Uh, with all the work that I do around technology, technology is only a tool. It's not going to be a savior. You know, it's not going to cure anything, but hopefully it's going to, we can use it to try to enhance communication, to enhance health, and improve quality of life, because otherwise, what's the purpose, you know, in what we're doing? So, think about the hammer that's appropriate. You don't always need the biggest and the newest. Think about what's appropriate for the groups that you're trying to work with to try to improve their health and well-being. So, a picture from North Carolina Beach, where I love to go. <laughs> Let's uh, work together to try to make the world better through the use of technology. Thank you so much and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> yes, Cliff. I, I know that, well I don't know the literature that well, but I know they make a distinction between like kind of young old people and very old people. Like did you notice any strong differences like in, is there like a predictor of what's the cutoff between the very elderly versus the only sort of elderly? Yeah, we, um, in our study, um, which was in, you know, these communities, yeah. um, we did not find any age interactions there um, that we, you know, that we found to date. Anyway, there may be something still out there that we haven't reached. But um, in general, yeah, older, older adults um, are more likely to have health impairments. That if they are learning to use new technology and they have a health issue, um, can significantly um, decrease their likelihood of coming back to be able to use that technology, even if they were using it previously. Uh, so it's conflated with the health challenges as people age, definitely. Yes? Yeah, we've done a paper now, uh, me and my students are looking at the impact of A-B explanations on age groups, you know, you know how the impacts. And so we're, we're talking, I was like, okay, you know, the groups, we know, oh, we got three groups, and I was like, you know, how do we define older adults? Mm -hmm. That's the term, older adults. And we did the literature, and according to the literature so far, we found on, on, on driving, ages 55 or older, mm -hmm. considered to be older adults. And uh, I just I think you know going forward we really got to rethink the way we define older adults because like Cliff was saying that probably going forward it's going to be a big wide spectrum mm -hmm. that I don't think people have actually considered. Yeah. Oh yeah, I would agree with you. You know what a uh, hundred year old thinks about AVs is probably very different than a sixty five year old who may still be in the workforce. Yes. You know. Yeah, definitely. I saw hands this week. Yes. I'm curious, especially since a lot of voice interfaces seem mm -hmm. to be marketed towards older adults. I'm curious what you think about there. Uh, yeah. I think there's huge potential for voice interface, um, but it's not without problems for older adults. Um, as you age, your voice changes. Uh, so um, it's, you're not quite as strong, as forceful in the voice. Um, so I think there are still limitations. It's much better than it was even a couple years ago in terms of the voice capabilities, but it's still got a ways to go in terms of that. But no, I do think it's the future, or maybe even the now, mm -hmm. almost. Yep. Um, with the fubbing work, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about why you think that the older population would be different than other um, age groups in uh, terms of their kind of, you know, appraisal I, of that behavior. Um, I think a lot of it's related to norms of interaction. Uh, so for 
um, older adults, at least to the ones that we've done some focus groups and interviews, and then, like I said, this big survey. Uh, they've told us in the focus groups and the interviews, you know, when I spend time cooking a big meal, like at Christmas or Easter or whatever, um, I want people to interact. I want to be able to communicate with my loved ones. I don't want them facing their phone, you know, or totally distracted. Um, you know, it's about feeling like you're important, like you matter, like you're not just, oh, here, I'm just a cook, you know. Um, so they find it very rude, um, and they find it um, really problematic. And so some of the older adults in our focus group said, you know, I make my family members put their devices on a table or, you know, in a basket or something until at least the meal is over. Because a lot of times the kids will eat real quickly and then go grab their device. And so they try to create these rules to change some of those behaviors. Uh, and sometimes they're successful and sometimes they're not. So different norms. I think that's a, a big part of it, you know, in terms of socialization and um, interaction expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have other thoughts? Um, no, I guess I was just curious as to whether there would be anything different about older folks versus middle aged. I mean, I think um, the the kind of emerging adults and, and younger seem seem to be in a, a kind of a different. Um, I don't know, kind of a different sen sensibility. Yeah. Um, but above that... Like the middle age group? Like how do they think? Is that where you're... Yeah, thinking? yeah. Yeah, and we haven't um, talked to any um, middle-aged people mm -hmm. to ask about that, but I think it is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and if you look at the usage rates of different devices, uh, they're pretty high users in general until you get to the end of you know, middle age. It tends to slow down a little bit, it seems like. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to think about the norms. I mean, because there is also that some work that suggests that they are used to kind of facilitate intergenerational mm -hmm. communication, yep. like grandparents or to getting manage. on Facebook yep. to see the baby pictures. And, yep. yeah. and it kind of fits into norms. I wonder if it's about interpretation of signals, right? So if young people are together, the fact of being together is a signal that I care about you, right? Like, it's not about a norm, it's about how we're actually interpreting cues yeah. about I, how people are... I was thinking that actually that if you had these young people who then were like taking pictures of the food to kind of boast about it on social media, that could be something that they see as a signal of, mm -hmm. hey, I'm showing you respect mm -hmm. by yeah. sharing your, your, you know, the, the lovely meal that you've made, whereas the perception of the, you know, the, the cook yeah. could be, why, why do you have your phone out? Yeah, yeah and uh, I will say in the focus groups and interviews that we did, they didn't talk too much about their kids or grandkids taking photos. It was more about the texting or the gaming, those kinds of activities, that, the social media mm -hmm. that they were doing, as opposed to taking photos and you know posting them, mm -hmm. per se. But we didn't ask about that either. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting, though, definitely. Robin, do you have your hand up? Yes, this might somewhat be a follow-up question. And I, I actually get this question a lot about my own research, so I'm curious about how mm -hmm. you approach it. But so you were showing statistics about the older adult demographic growing, and then there are also stats that show that they're using technology increasingly more and more. So is the digital much, divide going away? Right. How much yeah. of this will disappear with the next generation? Yes. Um, I don't think it's going to go away because technology is con consistently evolving. So I think even though we're very tech literate at whatever ages we happen to be, I think when we're 80, the technology is going to be very different. And so while we may be users of technology, we may not be users of the latest and greatest technologies. I don't know. What do you think? I take a similar approach. There will always be something new. And then also particularly with the, as you mentioned, the growth of people with disabilities, disabilities as you age, think that will remain mm -hmm. the same and that will Yeah, so all of our trainings in the um, retirement communities were group-based. Um, I have some colleagues at different universities who do um, more individual-based and then also peer-based. And they found success with each of the different um, techniques. I think it really depends upon the group and the um, specific issues that they may have. 
So for our community, um, given that there were mobility issues, there were um, some vision um, issues, um, so our materials were, were tailored uh, to respond to the individuals that we knew we were going to have that were in these communities. Um, so I think the more you can tailor it to what the group needs or the individual need is, I think the better and more successful it will be. But part of that's figuring out what that is ahead of time. Yes? Um, uh, it's interesting that you found no change in the use of health information. Um, and I was wondering if you have a sense for what their other sources of health information are and whether if there's a trust issue or if they just have the availability of um, providers or peers that they discuss health information with and so they don't feel the need or they don't trust the earn as much. Yeah, I, I think it's a range of those things. So in some of my earlier work, um, one of the things that we found is that the preference um, for older adults is that um, they'll turn to doctors first, yeah. and then they turn to family. And so it's trusted mm -hmm. um, networks that they turn to first, and so the internet isn't necessarily a trusted network for many older adults. Um, so I think that's definitely part of it, and then you know, the trust issue that's coming in, too. Yeah. I don't have a question. One of the things I've noticed tracking civic tech over the past few years is how rapidly a market evolved once it became clear the need was there. When we look at the silver tsunami, do you think that there's going to be a series of new technologies specifically marketed towards older people, especially as the boomers, the boomers have the money. If I were, right. uh, if I were, had an entrepreneurial bone in my body, I'd be like, here's an opportunity for specific technologies to make a ton of money off of this aging boomer population. And there are some companies that are trying to do that, but not as many as you would suspect, yeah, actually. And, you know, I mean, Facebook reached out to me years ago about some of my work, and I, you know, I tried to talk to them about older adults' views. They were not interested in the least. That's not who they're interested in. You know, so... Um, I mean, that Steve's an older adult. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I think we need more companies that are doing that. Or, you know, realistically, I think we need design for all, yeah. not design for the, you know, teens and tweens and 20-year-olds. You know, because if it's designed for all, then it's going to work better for everybody.